Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our second Sugar Hour meeting. This is for March 17th, 2021. Um, this meeting will be on putting your diabetes, diabetes into remission. And don't worry if you don't know what remission means, we'll be going into it very shortly in the beginning. Um, but again, thank you for joining. Uh, we're just going to get right started because we have a pretty packed presentation today. So today we'll be going over, like I said, just an introduction of, you know, the importance of weight loss and what remission even means. We'll go into some tips on exercise, diet, um, and then also managing stress. And then we have a little form at the very end for you to fill out for a chance to win our book, 30 Days to a um, Healthier You. Okay, so what exactly is putting diabetes into remission. So this is based on the definition given by the direct trial that we will also be talking about, but it's when your A1C value, which is a measure of your sugar levels over the past three months, when it's below 6.5, that is a cutoff for um, type two diabetes when you're above that, that cutoff. Um, and it's when you've discontinued all the diabetes medications for at least two months. I'll quickly be going over some common questions that we have before we get into the content of everything. Uh, some questions that we get, can anyone with type two diabetes go into remission? And there's still a lot that we're trying to understand at this stage. We don't know whether every person with type two diabetes can go into remission and there's more research to find ways uh, for more people to go into remission. For example, there's a retune study that's looking into people who don't have obesity um, and can put their diabetes into remission. And it studies a lot about whether low calorie diets can even help people with type two diabetes who aren't even obese. Um, so very similar to the direct trial, they asked patients to consume around 800 calories a day for up to two weeks and they, they'd be supervised by, by a medical team. Um, and then this cycle sort of repeats and essentially the bottom line of what they're trying to find is whether people with type 2 diabetes who, who you know aren't overweight are still able to go into remission, uh, which is like I mentioned early, earlier, keeping your blood sugar levels below that 6.5% range without any uh, help of medications. Um, another question that I get is, does remission prevent future complications? Uh, losing weight and being in remission, it helps to not only keep your blood sugar levels low, but it helps to keep your blood pressure low, your cholesterol levels low, and having low blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol levels, you know, they are usually linked to a lower risk of complications in the future, like problems with your eyes, feet, and your heart. But we don't know enough to say confidently that remission exactly leads or is directly correlated to um, um, sorry, reduced complications. So that's why you need regular health checkups. Um, and even when you're in remission and your blood sugars are healthy, you need to make sure you're continuously maintaining uh, that, low, that low body weight um, and being monitored regularly. Um, lastly, is remission permanent? So we do have reports of people who have been in remission for up to 15 years, but even if you're in remission, it's always possible that your blood sugar levels could just come back into the diabetes, diabetic range. So it's not just a one-off event, but it's a process and needs to be maintained. And the best way to do that is to keep a healthy weight and to stay active. And, you know, I recognize that you need a lot of support in this, you know, be accountable for the weight that you have. Uh, if it starts to creep back up again, then, you know, you can ask for extra support from, you know, family, friends, and also our clinic to adjust your eating patterns and keep your activity levels still high and regular and in check. Okay, so can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes. So I'll just be quickly talking a little bit about uh, something that Ginny mentioned, the direct trial and what really happened. And then I hope this will kind of give you a better sense of idea of what we're really trying to talk about in this uh, appointment and this meeting today. So there were approximately 300 patients and we gave basically half of them got just their standard diabetes care from their um, general practitioner. And the other half were kind of put into this very um, special structured weight program. And what I mean by a structured weight program is they had this very low calorie nutrient complete diet and they followed this 800 calorie diet for like three to five months. 
And so during this time, they also got support from a nurse and a dietitian um, to kind of introduce healthy foods into their diet and also give them a long term kind of support for maintaining that weight loss. And the one kind of distinction is that the, basically this group on the uh, that got the normal care, they had their medications and everything. And the group that just went on that low calorie diet, they were kind of taken off their medications and they were given this 800 calorie diet. So what did the study actually find? They found that in the group where they just continued their normal, you know, medications and their normal treatment, the amount of people that um, needed medications, the amount of participants in that group went up from 77% to 84%. And so you can see that there was like a slight increase in the amount of people that still needed their medications after the one year or two years had passed. Whereas um, in the group with the, uh, the, the, really great uh, low calorie diet that number would jump to 40 percent and so you can see a huge difference 40 percent versus 80 84 percent and we also see that the hba1c values dropped in the group that received that low calorie diet from 7.6 to 7.1 and in the other group it actually just went up slightly so what what does this really mean and how does this really help us so here we can basically see that this low calorie diet is able to really help um, us put that diabetes into remission. And we'll show a graph later that kind of solidifies this. And so I know I've been talking a little bit about calories and I just wanted to emphasize and kind of little, kind of have a little showcase of what I really mean by that and how you can calculate the amount of calories that you're using and you're consuming every day. So when we talk about calories, we're really talking about two different things. The basal metabolic rate which is basically just a number of calories that are required to just keep your body functioning and to complete the most basic tasks. And we are also talking about something called the total daily energy expenditure, which is basically like just the number of calories that are required for you to, you know, keep your body functioning when you take into account things like exercise, moving around, etc., cetera, et cetera. So here's a little formula that you can use to kind of get a good sense of what your basic metabolic rate is. So let's say you weigh 100 kilograms and you would multiply 100 by 10. And if you were also uh, let's say 200 centimeters or 150 centimeters, you would multiply that by 6.25. Um, factor in your age and then factor uh, in this last factor right here. And that will give you a basic metabolic range. And once you get that value, let's say it comes up to 2000 calories is just required for you to keep your body functioning. Then you would take that value and you would multiply it by one of these uh, bottom factors on the bottom right. And you would basically kind of look at your uh, daily expenditure, daily activity. And if you're, let's say you're a very uh, sedentary person, you kind of just sit uh, in an office all day or sit at home all day, you would multiply that by 1.2 and then it goes all the way up to 1.9 if you have a very extremely active lifestyle. And you know, where does this all come in and how does this fit with that trial I was just talking about? Just Essentially, back up for a second. Back up for a second. Yeah. It's Dr. Kern. You know, that, so this is actually a key measurement. Everybody should do their own. And uh, most of us think we exercise more than they do. Um, I, I got my, um, my Fitbit over here. And uh, how many calories do you think I burned today, you think? 600. 600? Yeah. Actually, I burnt, well, uh, 1,884. Wow. Yesterday, I burnt 2,800. And most days, about between 3,500 calories. I can go play tennis tonight. And so basically, <laughs> my basic metabolic rate will probably be around 1,600 calories. And to me, for me to get my weight down, I got to really lose, I got I, I to, gotta, calorie restrict myself, but also I exercise a lot so I can eat more. Um, and most of us overestimate how much activity we are. Most people are relatively sedentary or life active. I'm moderately active. Um, I wish I was very active or extremely active, but I have to class myself somewhere about moderately active. So everybody just take a look at this. So this is actually, so moderately active says that I do moderate exercise sports three to five times a week. So I do the Shadok stairs four times a week. I play tennis once a week. I go biking 
two times a week. And this week I only bike 60 kilometers. So um, I want to get up to the very active and that's so um, I can work at this. So if you're, if you're 65 years of age and you're sedentary, you don't do very much. You watch TV, you burp at the fridge, you burn about 1200 calories a day to live. So I think that's really important. Patrick, how many ca calories do you do? Uh, per day around, uh, I eat 900, but I normally do 350 or 400, not too much. I'm sedentary, so I'm, I'm one of the guys who is sitting in the desk and not doing too much. And I need yeah. to do more. So you have Definitely. to come play tennis with me and try to keep up a little bit. I would be, I can do it next week. But All you, right. be careful that I just lost, uh, I just lost 14 kilos. Fantastic. I'm Fantastic. in better shape now. All right. So, um, so to me, when it, so to me, the the, the really the, the the foundation for weight reduction for most of us is calorie restriction, followed by activity with support. So, to me, if if you don't <clears throat> encompass those three aspects of your life, it's going to be hard. And I would, and and Jenny and her team are going to tell you is that if you would have said to me. 10 years ago that you can put diabetes into remission, I would have said you're ridiculous because once you make the diagnosis of a touch of diabetes, type two diabetes, half the cells that make insulin are dead. The rest are working overtime, but you will learn this is possible. Uh, so I'll be quiet for a little bit. Go ahead. Just know your, your basic metabolic rate and how active you are and increase that activity. Exactly. And that's, that's exactly correct. So even if you can just slightly increase, um, you know, doing light exercise from one to three days to three to five days, you're actually going to have a huge increase in your total daily energy expenditure. And then once you do that, you'll be able to burn a lot more calories every day. And so how does this kind of tie into our low calorie diet? So let's say you're only, um, let's say you're only, you know, eating a thousand calories a day. And if you're burning 2000 calories a day, then you're kind of burning one, like there's this 1000 calorie surplus. And what does this do? Well, this is one of the proven ways to lose weight, calories in versus calories out. And the reason for this is because once, uh, you know, the body cannot get those calories from the food, it's gonna go to your fat. And that's one of the best ways the body can break down its fat to kind of provide calories for your body. And so once we start breaking down that fat, we can actually see that scale come down a little bit and it will bring us to our next slide where we can see the BMI. And so what is the BMI? It's something known as the body mass index. And what does it do? It kind of just gives us a sense of, um, a general sense of how our weight and our height plays into how uh, overweight we are, how obese we are, if we're normal weight or if we're underweight. And I know that this chart may seem a little bit complicated, especially the one on the top left there. But a really easy way um, to do this is just to go to Google, type in BMI index. Uh, this is the first thing that pops up and it's very simple. You can either use the standard um, metric or standard or metric um, way of measuring. You put in your height, you put in your weight and it pops out a number. And then you just use the chart on the uh, right there and you can look at see if you're normal, under, or overweight, underweight, or obese. And the goal we want is to lose enough weight or gain height. And of course, you know, we can't really gain height. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna try to lose that weight and try to come between 20 and 25 is ideal, uh, a good ideal healthy weight, uh, 20 to 25 BMI. And so why do I, you know, why are we talking a lot about this uh, weight loss, even though we're kind of in a diabetes remission, um, Kind of webinar the reason is just here on the right side here we can kind of see there's a little graph and we can see that at the most extreme right side we can see that uh, for patients who lost more than 15 kilograms in the direct trial their um, odds of going into remission for diabetes was 86 percent which is huge and for patients that lost 10 to 15 kilos 57 percent and you can see that these are huge numbers like huge swaths of people who are going and putting their diabetes into remission just by losing weight. And so I've kind of outlined this right at the bottom here. The bottom line is that weight loss works and it's the best way to put your diabetes into remission.
And so I think- For those who like pounds is basically you multiple by two and that will give you your pounds. So basically, uh, so really for most of us, it will be 20 to 30 pounds would be a target. Obviously you have to be overweight for us to do that. Um, um, And, or if you think in kilos, that's fine too as well. Um, Remarkable, remarkable. And there's actually more data to support this. Exactly. And so I think on the next slide, I think Ginny, you're going to be taking this on. Yep. So I'll be talking about this new paradigm shift that's happening. So I think previously before it was all, you know, about trying to find great treatment options for diabetes, you know, reduce, reducing that risk of cardiovascular disease. But there's been a new paradigm shift that's happened that focuses more on intervening much earlier to just prevent it from happening in the first place. And a lot of that has to do with reducing your weight um, at an early age for the most benefit on a lifetime impact uh, to reduce your risk of cardiovascular complications. So here, this was a study that looked at cardiovascular consequences of men with type 2 diabetes. Um, On the left, you see the impact of diabetes on men. So you have overall death and the numbers of years lost. And you see from the age of 40 years onwards, a lot of death happens because of cardiovascular disease. And so diabetes does shorten life expectancy from uh, cardiovascular disease. And even here, men with 50 years old, with type 2 diabetes, but with it without cardiovascular disease, they're actually around six years younger at the time of death than people who have. So on the right here is another clinical trial that shows that diabetes actually doubles the risk of cardiovascular events in the clinical trial. Um, And so, you know, this is something that we need to work on together. Here is um, obesity at two years. So looking at kids who are obese at the age of two years old. Um, And this was a study from the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at adverse impacts on future cardiovascular mortality. And kids at the age of two who are obese actually have an 80% chance or greater um, of having obesity at the age of 35. And, you know, this increases blood pressure and increases your risk of diabetes. So I think this just goes to show how important it is to reduce your weight. This is the longest single cohort uh, in the world. And, you know, this measures, uh, th- sorry, this study has measures of obesity for, you know, over 60 years of data. And in the lower panel here, you can see that people who lose weight over 10 years, there are much substantially more benefits with regards to arterial disease. Um, and so that, you know, this is just another example of how weight impacts, you know, cardiovascular disease, risk of diabetes, et cetera. I think this is actually a very important trial. If you just back one trial, this is again, the this is done in the United Kingdom. You were born in 1946, and then they followed you forever. And if you lose 10 pounds and keep it off over 10 years, you're healthier. Uh, so uh, this is really very impressive data. So it doesn't matter when you get the weight on, uh, but when you get it off. So 10 years of weight reduction will translate to meaningful benefit. Mm-hmm. And right now with, with COVID, we know that unfortunately, 40% of mortality is related to your weight. Uh, so so that's what I'm doing right now is that I don't know why I was talking to a guy yesterday and, and uh, he's in the ice cream sales. This has been the most successful year in business ever during the pandemic. Kind of sad that, you know, ice cream sales have skyrocketed, alcohol sales have skyrocketed. And I, know, I understand it's hard. So I, the first little while, we, you know, we, we lose to the pandemic. Now we're going to fight back. And so please, please think about how you can regroup and, and re- refocus right now. And, uh, and uh, Ginny and all the other teams, we're going to, we'll help if you want to. It's, yes, it's a lot of hard work, um, but you know what? Um, I can do it. You can do it. We can all do it in our own way. So one pound at a time. Exactly. Okay, moving forward. Um, So you can see that weight loss in actually pre-diabetic patients, so people who have A1C below 6.5. So it's between the 6 and the 6.5 range normally. Um, So through various interventions, you know, to lose weight and reduce your risk, it substantially lowered the risk of cardiovascular events. And so this isn't diabetic patients. These are people who have pre-diabetes and don't have diabetes yet. So it's equally effective for those of you who are pre-diabetic. 
So a large part of prevention, you know, all this data that I'm presenting, it's to focus on, you know, reducing your weight and actually investing more time and more in your arteries and keeping, you know, your cholesterol levels down through weight loss, healthy diet, exercise, and just an overall healthy lifestyle. So this tells us if you backtrack is that 90% of heart disease is preventable. We often go to the clinical events, people start to react um, once they had their heart attack, once they had their stroke, once they, you know, why, why wait so long? You know, we, the blockage starts the day you're born. And uh, so to me is that starting earlier and starting consistently and have ups and downs and all this makes sense. Mm -hmm. And here's the science. And this slide here is to show that right now there's been a lot of new and exciting research done right now for uh, diabetes threshold for obesity. So what I mean by that is above a specific BMI threshold, there's a substantial increase in the risk that you see here. It's not gradual, but it sort of shoots up after that threshold is, is reached. So rather than it being cumulative over time, there there's been research right now looking into an individual's threshold to develop diabetes. And this could really help with diabetes management in, in just clinics in the future. So keeping your weight down below that specific threshold, you know, this is new data that will have to be tested later on in clinical trials. Okay, so this here is a study done um, that looked at, so semiglutide is just another, it's the general term for Ozempic. And some of you may be using Ozempic now, it's just an injection once um, a week to lower blood sugar levels. And then it's also been shown to, uh, for patients to help with weight reduction as well. So this is um, higher doses of 2.4 milligrams as a more promising treatment option for weight management in patients uh, with obesity and are also a uh, type 2 diabetic. So this was a phase three randomized placebo controlled trial, which essentially means that you're using, you're splitting people randomly into groups, uh, one having a higher dose and then one who believes they have a higher dose of Ozempic, but, um, oh, sorry, 2.4 milligram dose, a one milligram dose and placebo, which is, um, you don't know if you're getting the real dose or not, but they're you know, this group is not actually getting the dose. And, you know, they tested this for about 68 weeks. They followed up uh, bi-weekly, so every two weeks. And they looked at outcomes with percentage change in body weight um, and, you know, loss of greater than or equal to 5% of their baseline weight at that 68 week mark at the very end. Uh, and they found that adults who were, you know, obese or overweight and also had type 2 diabetes, getting that once a week dose of 2.4 milligrams of Ozempic um, with lifestyle intervention, it helped a lot and it significantly decreased mean body weight um, for these patients as opposed to or compared to the one milligram dose as well as the placebo group. Now, the SELECT trial is an ongoing randomized control trial as of right now, which looks at cardiovascular outcomes. Um, and so, you know, they looked at, again, the uh, impact or benefits of Ozempic, and they'll be following these patients along um, to see if it, you know, impacts anything with cardiovascular outcomes. And we'll also be speaking more, you know, about this great medication on April 14th, which is when our next sugar hour meeting is happening. So to me, Ozempic is a, is a, is a drug that um, we're thinking about for people. The only sad part it is it's quite expensive. It's about $250 a month um, using either 0 0.2, 0 0.5 or 1 milligram a day. And at, at, at 2.4 mil, 2 milligrams a day, you can lose 20% of body weight in, in some people. And that's a huge amount of weight. That's almost the same as bariatric surgery, where it's around 20 to 30% of body weight on, on, on average. So um, this is, so I'm not saying this is the drug for you or not, but there are options available. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm truly, truly amazed uh, how good this medication to suppress appetite. Nothing suppresses my appetite truly, uh, but this makes a huge impact uh, when I, when I have used it. So uh, um, I, I see Bo's on the line there. Does, uh, Bo, where do you think Ozempic fits into your um, repertoire of uh, medication? And we'll talk about a lot more next time. Yeah. Our goal right now is to get diabetes in remission. Um, and uh, where, where, where do you see about uh, Ozempic or other well, classes? I, I think Dr. Kerner, we're using it a lot more. Um, 
it, I think your point and what Jenny and the whole group have been talking about with the prevention and remission, I really see a real a role for Ozempic there. It would have been, as you said, it'd be great if we could get it get it going before, you know, if a person pre, has pre-diabetes, if they have insulin resistance, if they're battling with their weight and they're not really getting anywhere, it'd be great if we could start it before they actually develop diabetes. But adding it to our repertoire, and actually the other point, if people are already taking insulin and we add the Ozempic, they can often get by with lower insulin doses, which also helps with weight loss in, just on its own as well. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about plant-based diets. So when you want to put diabetes into remission, one component of that is controlling your blood sugar or your serum glucose. And there's two ways to go about this. So one way is reducing the amount you're eating. So that's your portion size. or reducing the caloric density of what you're eating. So eating lower calorie foods. And in order to achieve either of these things, there's kind of three factors involved. First is reducing your fat consumption. Next is increasing the amount of fruits and vegetables you eat. And finally, it's increasing water content. And when we think about the diet that most fits the bill for these three factors, it's a whole food plant-based diet. It capitalizes on increasing that fruit and vegetable consumption. And being plant-based, you're gonna get less saturated fats in your diet and it can also increase your water content. So it's kind of the diet that best fits the bill for reducing and controlling that serum glucose. So how exactly can plant-based diets get diabetes into remission? Well, they're high in fiber and fiber reduces the caloric value of the foods you're eating. It also reduces inflammation. And plant-based foods are high in vitamins and minerals, particularly antioxidants, which can help decrease your glucose absorption, so the amount of sugar you're absorbing from the foods you're eating, as well as the hepatic output, so how much sugar your liver is putting into your blood. And then finally, they're also low in saturated fats. Saturated fats primarily come from animal products. So by going to plant products, you'll primarily be eating more unsaturated fats, which are considered to be like the healthier fats. And lower in saturated fat means a decrease in inflammation. So the combination of these things helps promote weight loss as well as insulin sensitivity. So it helps in addition to losing weight, it can also help make your cells a little more responsive to insulin, which is what's secreted to help bring your blood sugar down. So what exactly does the research say? Well, I'll start by talking about the BROAD trial. So this is a randomized control trial and it comprised of participants from a region of New Zealand where being overweight and having ischemic heart disease, diabetes and cardiovascular risk factors was quite common. So this trial tried to look at the effect of a low fat plant-based diet on individuals who were either obese and overweight and had either diabetes, ischemic heart disease, or cardiovascular risk factors. So this was either hypertension, like high blood pressure, or hypercholesterolemia, which is high cholesterol. So the participants were recruited. They were split into two groups, the intervention group, which was 33 people, food-based diet. So... Can you go? Okay, so they're on a whole food plant based diet along with B12 supplementation, whereas the control group was just put on normal care. And then they were followed up at three months, which was the end of the study. Uh, for the intervention group, they were um, followed up every two weeks to kind of see how they were going on with the diet. And then there was a six month follow up for gr both groups and then a 12 month follow up for the intervention group. So the starches that were encouraged as part of this diet were things like sweet potatoes, bread, cereal, and it was also suggested that the participants who were on the whole food plant-based diet avoid foods that were high in fat, so oils, animal products, nuts, avocados, and highly processed foods. So for the results, at the 12-month mark, there was a reduction in BMI of 4.2 kilograms per meter squared. So that's 4.2 units going down. There was a reduction in cholesterol by 0.55 millimoles per liter at the 12-month 
mark, and there was also an HbA1c, so your glycated hemoglobin, reduction by 5 millimoles per mole at the 12-month point. And I just have a little uh, chart below because when we look at our HbA1c on the blood work, it comes up as a percentage, so we'll see like a number like 6.5. And when you read the millimole per mole, it's not really clear what that means. So just to give you an understanding, if someone started the trial off at a 48 a millimole per mole reading that would correspond to 6.5 percent for their hba1c if they followed this trend of the intervention with the whole food plant-based diet and they experienced this reduction of up to five millimoles per mole they would go down to 43 which would correspond to six to between six to 6.4 percent so they would no longer be in that diabetes range but rather the pre-diabetic range And just a couple of additional studies. There's a 2006 study that looked at a plant-based diet versus what was recommended by the American Diabetes Association at the time. And just comparing the outcomes of those two diets, there was a 46% reduction in taking medications on plant-based as opposed to 26 on the American Diabetes Association or ADA diet, a 1.23 reduction in hemoglobin A1C compared to 0.38 and then a 6.5 kilogram reduction compared to a 3.1 kilogram reduction. And finally, there's a 2014 meta-analysis that basically showed that a vegetarian diet would help reduce your HbA1c values by 0.39. So what exactly do these results and all of these numbers mean? Well, it's basically just showcasing that plant-based diets can help promote insulin sensitivity and weight loss, both of which can help put your diabetes into remission. Your HbA1c, BMI, and cardiovascular risk factors can all lower on plant-based diets. And in fact, within the broad trial, there are two patients who, after going on the intervention diet, no longer met the diagnostic criteria for diabetes after they had tried the plant-based diet. Um, so next, I'm just going to briefly talk about Mediterranean versus plant-based diet. So the Mediterranean diet is something you might have heard of. It's similar to the plant-based diet in that it involves a lot of plant-based foods. Um, the main things is that olive oil is the primary source of fat in this diet, and it does allow a low to moderate amount of meat, dairy, eggs, and wine. So there are some trials and reviews that have shown that the Mediterranean diet can help with weight loss and the reduction of cardiovascular risk factors, which could be beneficial in putting your diabetes into remission. The main difference between Mediterranean versus plant-based is Mediterranean is mostly plant-based, but not entirely, and plant-based diets are completely plant-based. So there was a 2021 publication that was a randomized crossover trial to compare the two diets and see which might be more effective at putting your diabetes into remission by reducing your weight and cardiovascular risk factors as well as your HbA1c. So basically how this trial was structured is that they took patients, they were put on a diet, either the Mediterranean or the plant-based for 16 weeks. Then for four weeks, they went back to their diet at baseline. So what they had before the study and then another 16 weeks on the opposite type of diet. So they, they started off with Mediterranean for 16, then the next 16 that they did was the plant-based diet. And this trial looked at body weight, plasma lipids, blood pressure, body composition, insulin sensitivity, and insulin resistance. So for the results, as you can see, the plant-based diet was superior in almost every category. It resulted in more weight loss. It helped decrease insulin resistance while increasing insulin sensitivity. It also helped lower your total and LDL cholesterol. The only area where the Mediterranean diet was more superior is for blood pressure reduction. So essentially what the outcome of the study was is that plant-based diets are more effective at lowering weight, boosting insulin sensitivity, and lowering cholesterol than the Mediterranean diet. So if you're trying to choose a diet to help put your diabetes into remission, a plant-based diet might be a more effective one to choose. So this is actually important. You just pointed to two randomized controlled trials with the highest level of evidence. And uh, so the Mediterranean diet is a, is a great diet. Uh, the ADA diet, American Diet Association diet, is a great diet as well. But if you're trying to lose weight, plants, whole foods work better. Now, olive oil, which is a very healthy oil, uh, actually lowered blood pressure better than, than weight reduction. So you can see that there's a lot of good properties to, you know, to, to, to oils. But the problem is they're calorie dense, they're a lot of calories. And so to me, this is actually really 
it really shows the difference of different diets. And, and to me is that if your number one priority is to, to lose weight at this stage, then you know you have really good science to support that you will lose an extra 10 pounds if you're a plant-based eater compared to a standard, standard low cholesterol diet, Mediterranean diet, American Diet Association diet. But you can see that um, uh, oils or olive oil, you know, extra virgin olive oil that's cold pressed has is rich in antioxidants. Walnuts, hazelnuts are, are, are rich um, in um, healthy nut or healthy oils, but they're also calorie dense. And so you have to sort of think about this. So, um, so you know, people say, well, I just have a little bit of olive oil. I've just have a few nuts, but I, I think it's it's shown it. You know, is that we're always hungry. And so Ginny showed us a nice trial where uh, Ozempic can actually cut down your appetite. Um, we also learned that all these trials to be successful is that you're meeting every week or every two weeks with your with your group or your individuals, your, your support population as well. So it's not just the food, it's all the infrastructure around that. And uh, I have to give a credit to Didi as that she's, we, we, we launched um, um, our plant-based batch cooking on, on Sundays. We had our first successful meeting uh, a, a couple weeks ago, and we're gonna have one coming up on, on April. And uh, I learned a lot of cooking uh, from you and uh, and just a lot of good helps tips and things of that nature. So please all come and join. You can decide if you want to have you know, plant day on, on Mondays or if you want to bring it up a notch or two or, or how you look at this. Um, anything else about this idea that you want to mention about this? Because I think it just shows you very clearly uh, the results that you get is that antioxidants that you get in olive oil are good, but they're rich in calories. Mm -hmm. And they're really good too as well. Um, but they also lower weight. And because you lose weight, you lower your blood sugar. Yeah, for sure. It, all all of the diets of the ADA, Mediterranean, plant-based, they're all good. It kind of just depends on what you're looking for as the method of um, kind of getting your diabetes into remission. So if you're kind of looking for the best way to lose weight while reducing some of your risk factors, going more plant-based is definitely an avenue to consider. And I'm just going to briefly talk about how you can start to go plant-based. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, so one of the simplest ways to do it is to start choosing plant-based proteins. So from the Canada Food Guide, about a fourth of your plate should be made up of protein foods. And you can start to add more plant-based proteins into this to help you get to that um, plant-based diet, especially if it's something that's new to you and you're not quite sure how you can make yourself more plant-based. So great examples of plant-based proteins are legumes, so lentils and beans. You can even add nuts and seeds, but they are high in calories. So keep in mind what portion size you're using. And then things like tofu or oatmeal, quinoa, they all have a lot of protein in them as well. And finally, if you're new to plant-based eating or it's something you're considering, you can check out all of our wonderful webinars, Science of Plant-Based Eating, Healthy Cooking for Less. They all have great um, talks on plant-based eating and plant-based recipes. And as Dr. Kearney mentioned, we did start that um, batch cooking club on Sundays and we have an upcoming session in April. So if that's something you're interested in, you can also sign up for that. Okay, so um, moving on, like an, um, along with like uh, the plant-based diets, uh, another type of diet that could help with your diabetes is low-carb, high-fat diets, or also known as LCHF. And basically, they're sort of designed in a way to help deal with uh, diabetes, diabetes, and also uh, improve your quality of life. And also, one type of LCHF diet that's sort of like commonly uh, thrown around is the ketogenic diet, which we'll sort of briefly cover in this presentation. So basically what a LCHF diet is, is that um, it sort of originated from Sweden, which was spearheaded by Dr. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that last name, uh, uh, Dr. Annika, who basically recommended LCHF to her diabetic patients. So the question oh. is, is sort of like, how does a high fat and a low carbohydrate diet help you deal with diabetes or how does it help you lose and sort of maintain your weight? So insulin is something that's sort of, um, produced by your body to take the carbohydrates to eat and then you and then to put them to use, whether that be through creating energy or sort of generating an energy storage to help you uh, feel energized and healthy throughout your day. However, because um, diabetes is sort of characterized by an impairment 
to sort of regulate the carbohydrates that you take uh, um, with insulin sort of being a, um, a major issue. Uh, your body sort of can't adequately handle the carbohydrates that you intake compared to if you didn't have diabetes. So in order to combat this, uh, LCHF is sort of designed for you to eat uh, uh, as little sort of amount of carbohydrates as you're able to so that your body sort of doesn't need to use it or doesn't need to primarily run on carbohydrates as a major source of energy for you. So on the next slide here, um, generally for LCHF diets, uh, carbohydrates are kept to a minimum anywhere between 20 to 100 grams per day. However, this can vary uh, based on what type of diets you're taking because LCHF in general is sort of like an umbrella term that encompasses a lot of different uh, subtypes of diets, if you will, such as like uh, a ketogenic diet. So in general, to sort of keep low carbohydrates in your diet, you want to avoid like uh, grains, starches, uh, sweeteners like honey and maple syrup, uh, fruits, uh, processed foods, and other things that are sort of um, traditionally sugary. Um, foods that are sort of recommended for an uh, LCHF diet are eggs, uh, oils like olive oil. However, um, like was mentioned previously, um, just because you take um, um, less carbohydrates doesn't mean you need to. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't worry about like your calorie intake as well. So you should keep that in mind when eating foods uh, that have high fat. Um, and other foods include fish, uh, meat and poultry, uh, full fat dairy, uh, non-starchy vegetables, and nuts and seeds. So overall, the, the foods that you want to take uh, have low carbohydrates while having sort of a large amount of fat. So there's a lot of benefits in terms of adopting LCHF diets, uh, which include but aren't limited to uh, a greater improvement of sort of blood sugar control because you're not uh, taking in that many car uh, that much carbohydrates for your body to try and sort of regulate and also um, it leads to a more substantial reduction in diabetes medication compared to some other diets that uh, have been clinically tested uh, furthermore because you're eating sort of a lot of fat a uh, fat generally sort of takes um, longer to sort of digest and it makes you feel full more so uh, having an LCHF diet or undergoing that type of diet um, has been shown to uh, overall reduce hunger in participants who are taking it and has also been uh, linked to weight loss as well, which is evident by uh, a study that's um, had 88% uh, of their participants. Uh, they basically followed a ketogenic diet, which is a type of LCHF diet. And basically they lost more than or um, yeah, equal to or more than 10% of their initial weight and managed to sort of maintain that weight loss uh, for over for over a year for uh, during that duration of which they were followed for the study. However, with these uh, sort of uh, health benefits, there's also uh, some downsides in terms of uh, adopting or having LCHF diet. Firstly, which is probably the most uh, one of the most difficult things is the transition as it may require you to sort of completely change your dietary habits and the usual food items that you enjoy. Uh, furthermore, on top of that, it takes a significant amount of sort of planning and commitment in order to sort of regulate your diets to make sure that you're taking in uh, the right proportions of carbohydrates and fat in order to gain an LCHF diet's full effects. Um, and on that point, um, Generally, a transition from a regular diets or whatever diet that you're having to an LCHF diet is generally well to tolerated. However, there are some known side effects, uh, especially uh, m sort of most prominent during that transition phase, which includes sort of weakness, fatigue, and other uh, symptoms. So I guess something that's important to stress, that's important to sort of consult um, uh, your doctor or, a medic or, or professional medical advice before undergoing LCHF and to make sure that you're able to find one that's right for you because uh, as mentioned previously this is a sort of an umbrella uh, philosophy that encompasses a lot of different types of diets that you could take. So actually what I like about these diets you can just backtrack is that uh, to me is that you can certainly try different diets so we we have a, a webinar on basically making it a high fish high fat diet with low carbohydrates and uh, 
you know, the Americans have actually popularized and, and some, for some people, it, this can be a great source of initial weight reduction. It can be a long-term strategy for some people. Um, but for most people, it's, it's very non-sustainable. Um, but saying that is rotating, trying different diets at different times from intermittent fasting is um, Patrick will talk to you about in, in a bit about, you know, opt to fast, eating more soups and more plant-based eating or or just or, or, or trying this diet is, is not unreasonable. But the thing to do is, you know, there's nothing good about butter and processed meat and things of that nature. They're high in fat, but they're not healthy uh, ingredients. So you can go on a high fat diet that's healthier. That can be with, you know, avocados, olive oil. And the reason why um, uh, you can use these things is if you get rid of carbohydrate. And when I did this, I had a modified version of it. My wife said it wasn't a true keto diet. Uh, but I eliminated bread, and pasta, and cereal, and that's one of my great sources of calories. I don't know about you guys, but when I have one piece of toast, I want to have three, four, five, six pieces of toast. And um, uh, but um, I, you know, this can work for some people, and you have to decide if it's the right diet for you or not. So at one time, I think it was a bad idea. Now, you know what? Not so bad for some people. Um, Bo, did you have um, have an opinion about these types of diets? Yeah, I think actually what you were starting to touch on, Dr. Kernu, is um, sometimes you, we just need to change something. And if you get the right information and you, you get prepared uh, and you plan ahead and you try any one of these diets, you know, it's worth it's worth trying because it's not a one size fits all. And uh, it, some some people find certain diets are easier for them to stick with and Obviously, the, the more committed you are and the longer you're on one of these diets, the more results you're going to get. So um, I, I think, you know, it, it's just good for people to try any one of these diets. Uh, I think it's like uh, we were talking at the beginning. It's energy, calories in, calories out, and sometimes we just need to pay attention to what we are eating. And, you know, like any sports franchise, you mix up your players, you make trades, you try different things and have fun trying. So um, um, I never thought um, I would try Ozempic. I never tried. I thought a high fat diet. I never thought I'd try intermittent fasting, but I'm really enjoying all these sorts of things. And the thing that makes it work for most of us is that support from others, from from your family, friends and your environment as well. And because I'm working with the um, the exercise group that's going to meet afterwards and because I'm working with the weight loss group, I'm now fasting one day a week for 24 hours because they're doing it. And so, um, and it resets me for the week. And so I'm not saying it's, you know, it's right or wrong for you, but try different things and, uh, and, and don't just, and, uh, you know, learn your body, but also do it in a smart way as well and use as much science as you can. And thank you for sharing um, uh, this good science. Um, um, thank you. Yeah, and um, just uh, the last thing, sort of briefly touching on LCHF diet, I guess uh, one thing that's sort of uh, commonly sort of talked about by a lot of people or the media and also what clearly sort of demonstrates what a low carbohydrate, high fat diet is, is the ketogenic diet. And basically um, it's a sort of diet that has, it, it's sort of strictly monitored and controlled and it's designed to sort of keep your, um, keep your, uh, dietary intake to a certain level of percentages in order to make sure that you have low carbohydrates and high fat. So for example, um, the Health Canada website lists uh, a standard keto, a keto diet as 10% of your energy come from carbohydrates while having 75-80% of your energy come from fats. And obviously uh, the ketogenic diet is very strict and is uh, not really applicable to all people. But general, um, I believe um, I think the the um, another sort of organization that has more uh, real realistic uh, guidelines for people uh, uh, to undertake sort of an LCH of diet is having like 40% from of your energy from carbohydrates and 40% of your energy from fats. And basically, the, the the general idea is to try and limit your carbohydrates and sort of try to put more of your uh, uh, of you, what you use for energy into uh, from fats that you intake. And that's uh, essentially what uh, an LCHF diet is um, meant to do. 
Okay, now we're going to be talking about some exercise. So we talked a lot about diet, and I think there was a lot of good comments made about you know trying something different. So just just try something different, and you know see what works for you and what doesn't. Uh, but now we're going to be going into um, exercise or activity levels, because especially with COVID going on right now, there is definitely a danger with a sedentary lifestyle. So it doesn't just because we're having to stay indoors doesn't mean that you know we can't try different indoor activities and also be going out for walks with the weather turning out a lot nicer. And so here's a picture of a sedentary dog. <laughs> okay, so I think in general, for me at least, exercise, you know, it's. I wouldn't say it's key to lose the weight, but I think it definitely helps with maintaining that weight,、um, and it also helps to stay active with that caloric restriction that we talked about earlier. So it's definitely easy to engage in that sedentary behavior, especially when you're stuck at home. So it does lead to some health risks.、Um, Studies have shown that it's two. You're 2.47 times more likely to develop diabetes, 1.7 times more likely to develop cardiovascular death, and 1.4 times、uh, more likely to cause for all cause mortality. And on the left graph, we see it shows longer time spent sedentary,、uh, and two-hour plasma glucose level has increased, which means that you know you have worse glycemic control.、Uh, but on the right. It's longer time spent doing, you know, light exercise activities, and it greatly reduced that two-hour plasma glucose levels. So, you know, it, it's helpful to you know, stay active, especially for your for your sugars. So, breaking up sedentary activities to improve that glycemic control can include, you know, start by standing up for five minutes. You know, every thirty minutes, just so you're not you're avoiding that time spent just sitting down, or taking three minutes to get up、um, and walk every thirty minutes. But on the American Diabetes Association website, it says that you know this should be done in addition to a structured exercise routine. It's all about developing those small habits.、Uh, here are some benefits of exercise.、Uh, so there's increased weight loss, increase in insulin sensitivity, and type two diabetes is you know when you are you know you develop a resistance to insulin.、Um, so increased cardiovascular fitness, increase in muscle strength, and It prevents or delays that that diabetes development, as well as an increase in patient well-being. So here are other are the different types of exercises that I've just outlined in general. So aerobic exercises is when you're doing repeated and continuous movements for some of the larger muscle groups, and then resistance exercises、um, is when you know you're doing strength training and your muscles are working against a specific weight or force. And then, as well as flexibility and balance, and it's helped to improve that range of motion, and it, it helps a lot to prevent falls as well. So we'll be going into more detail for these. So aerobic exercises are really great for the heart, lungs,、um, and insulin function, which I've listed here. Resistance exercises are really great、uh, to build up strength and to help with physical functions and bone density. And then flexibility and balance exercises are. Great for, like I mentioned earlier, that range of motion,、uh, neuropathy,、um, and to reduce the number of falls as well. So this is something I like to call the two twos of exercise habits, and it's from the Diabetes Canada website. So the first two stands for two days. So you know you're taking a maximum of two days between your exercise sessions, and this is, you know, I think daily exercises are ideal. But we all need breaks here and then, especially at the start. So maximum of two, and then the second two stands for 2.5 hours, and this is a minimum amount of exercise that you should be getting per week. And of course, this is in addition to any dietary changes that you're doing to help delay that、uh, development of diabetes. Some aerobic exercises that you can try now.、Uh, so it's it's recommended that you get 150 minutes of moderate to high intensity exercise per week. And some examples of that is some brisk walking, which can be really great now that the weather is turning up.、Uh, dancing, which is something that I personally really enjoy doing.、Uh, gardening, bicycling, ellipticals, hiking, tennis, and climbing stairs. Uh, and don't worry if you can't exercise for long periods of time right off the bat. You can start at a comfortable pace for around five to fifteen minutes at a time, and then gradually progress up to fifty minutes per section with, for example, brisk walking. And the important thing is that you keep trying, you keep going at it. And I've also recommended, you know, journaling has helped a lot of people. It keeps you accountable, and it also is really good to track your progress along the way. 
Interval training is also another great option. So your alternate short periods of high intensity activities, more high intensity activities are things like jogging and running. Um, and then this is followed by something more low intensity, such as brisk walking. So alternating between the two can help to, you know, keep that progress going and to also give you breaks here and now. So here are some easy aerobic exercises. Um, let's see if we'll play here. Okay, there you go. So you're just reaching to both sides. And these are just two examples out of many. And if you simply uh, search aerobic exercises online, there's a lot of great resources out there and I'll also be outlining them near the end. Okay. Ooh. Okay. So some resistance exercises that you can try. So it's recommended by the Diabetes Canada website that you do these resistance exercises two to three times per week. And a lot of these can be easily done even without rate, weights or resistance bands. And this diabetes uh, resistance exercise chart is something that I found on the website. So you're, you're able to access that as well. Resistance bands are a really good thing to consider though. And they're around $17 for five bands. Um, you can get it at Walmart or even Canadian Tire. And they make exercises a lot more convenient. And there's also a lot of videos on the Diabetes Canada website that carries you through each exercise step by step. So no worries about that. And uh, to start, you can pick maybe six to eight exercises and then gradually increase until you can perform like three sets of eight to 12 repetitions and make it somewhat of a routine for yourself. Best evidence supports using weights, but of course you should consult your doctor or physiotherapist to make sure that you're minimizing any harm. Here are some examples of resistance training without weights or resistance bands. Wall push-ups can really help to strengthen your biceps, triceps, and pectoralis muscles. And chair squats can really help with your gluteus, quadriceps, and hamstrings. And the chair also helps to prevent any falls from happening. Here are some examples of flexibility and balance exercises, and these really help to improve your mood and they can also be done in the comfort of your own home. So these are really, uh, I think, easy, lighter exercises to do. Here are some resources that can help to get you started. So a lot has been from the Diabetes Canada website. They have really great information sheets, recommendations for safe and effective exercises, and also plans that you can try out. And then Live Well with Diabetes is at the YMCA and they have an exercise education program for type 2 diabetics who are running out um, and you know there's several YMCA uh, including in Hamilton, Brantford and Halton and they have these supervised exercises with a trained kinesiologist and if you're interested you can check with your doctor about eligibility criteria and then also potential referral. And then also these are more user-friendly YouTube videos with guided exercises for diabetes. So uh, Caroline Jordan is really great, uh, Thai Flow, and then Yoga with Adrian are all great things to consider. Okay, these are so even more weight loss resources. So the More Than Weight Loss Wellness Center is an independent clinic that focuses on providing that one-on-one -on -one weekly personalized caring support, weight and measurement progress analysis, and continuous education uh, to help you learn more about how to achieve your goals and sustain your results on more of a long-term basis. And the Bariatric Medical Weight Management Clinic at St. Joe's is uh, a hospital-based outpatient program that helps to that helps you to reach your health and weight goals and Together, um, the term bariatric actually means together, they mean weight treatment. And so this program focuses on helping parent, uh, patients really achieve this healthier state of wellness. And they provide a lot of knowledge and life skills to, to, to change your eating and coping behaviors and to also develop you know, a healthier lifestyle with, with healthy eating, physical activity, as well as healthy eating. Uh, the Wharton Medical Clinic uh, is OHIP covered and it's run by a team of internal medicine specialists. And you do need a referral from your physician um, and, and a, for an appointment. And the YMC provides that evidence-based program that focuses a lot on long-term weight management rather than just weight loss at the very start. And so it's built on a lot of scientific principles and they focus on preventing further weight gain um, like I mentioned earlier, rather than just to that simple weight loss. And so they focus on caloric deficits 
and at each visit you'll be monitored to ensure that your meal plan targets uh, stay appropriate for your weight loss goals. And then the last one that I've listed here is Dr. Kearney's cardiology clinic. And he, uh, as he mentioned, there's a weight loss club available and they have, we have a lot of helpful videos available on our YouTube channel that can give you a lot of insight on cardiovascular disease and obesity and other related topics. Okay, Pace at McMaster is one that a couple patients use as well. And they have a lot of programs, uh, exercise programs that help uh, patients with spinal cord injuries. They also have a cancer exercise program. They have an MS Fit exercise program, uh, which is for cardiac rehab exercise program as well. Um, and then seniors exercise and wellness program. So they have many, many programs available. Um, before starting it, uh, participants actually need to ask their primary care physician for a complete referral form. And um, they need to do an exercise stress test. And this test is done at the McMaster Medical Center. And so you can call 905-521-5021 um, uh, to ask for more information and then um, be recommended by a physician. And right now, PACE is actually hosting live virtual exercise classes with a registered kinesiologist and physiotherapist so that you're able to tune in right from your home. All right, cool. So now we're going to talk about the BRAVE trial, which is actually happening, you know, at McMaster and at St. Joe's. Um, we've talked about it on our live stream before, but BRAVE basically stands for bariatric surgery for the reduction of cardiovascular events. Uh, so, so, so basically what they're looking at is improving heart health um, through weight reduction. And so one of the things we know is that, you know, weight loss can help with prevention and reducing your risk. But, you know, very little studies have, you know, really looked at patients who already have suffered, you know, a stroke, a heart attack, or have cardiovascular complications, and how, you know, weight, how, you know, losing weight would help with that. So basically the question becomes, you know, how does bariatric surgery compared to medical weight management, which we'll talk to, we'll talk about in a bit, um, decrease the risk of cardiovascular complications in severely overweight patients with high risk uh, heart disease. So I'm gonna, you know, pass it on to Patrick here to talk to us a little bit here, um, and then I'll, I'll take over. Uh, Patrick, I think you're muted. Sorry, I can share the screen, uh, Vinny, yes? I, I don't hear you. Yeah, you should just give me one moment. Let me double check here. Yeah. So the BRAVE trial is a randomized controlled trial that's sponsored by McMaster and Patrick is actually uh, in the trial and uh, he's gonna tell you his experiences, weight loss journey. I don't think I... Yeah, are you screen sharing? Do you want to continue? Yes. Okay, I will share my screen. Let me close all my stuff. And can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I give you a little bit of background. Uh, when I came in 2000, I was 170 pounds. Uh, I was uh, I was a young, very active. I was uh, I pr played professional squash, play soccer, so I was in good shape. Then, from 2000 to 2010, I worked in the media world and only gained 10 pounds more. So, in 2010, I was 210. Then, uh, in 2011, my mistake. I'm not sure mistake, but I worked for a pastry company who was selling. Um, pastries to all the Tim Horton goodies that you see. I was selling them all the baguettes that you see. I was selling them. And by some reason, uh, in five years, I gained 40 more pounds. Then, unfortunately, in 2014, I had a heart attack with 50. And then I met Mr. Cur uh, Dr. Kearney and uh, since 2015 or 615, tried to lose weight for seven years and tried different things. And I will tell you my journey, how it happened. So this is a presentation not to tell you what to do because uh, I just felt very bad because I try most of the things that you have done. This, I want only to show you my journey, my struggles. What I try, I was finally share my progress, nothing else. This is not a teaching and I feel like kind of, so I'm 57, I started in, in February 4, 228 pounds. 
and I came to Canada was 170. So I had a, had a heart attack in July 3, 2014. Uh, Patrick, sorry, yes. but are you sharing your screen right now? I'm, yes. I, I don't see your presentation. Uh, yes. Uh, wait, uh, let me see. I thought it's, I'm sharing it. Um, let me figure it out. I am uh, Zoom. Uh, well, they're trying to figure that out there. Um, bro, any comments about what you're seeing on people's weight loss journeys along the way and uh, there are some of the struggles and things that made people more successful? Uh, I think as we already said, Dr. Kernu, it's not easy. You know, I have patients sometimes they're almost, they almost think we don't believe them. You know, they say in terms of what they're currently doing because they're in a situation where they've gained a certain amount of weight and they, they're just really, um, they're, they're really at, at their wits end really. And they're, um, I think, um, Again, we, I, I think a lot of support, listening to people and trying to work with them to figure out what what can help them. Because it, it's, it's never easy. You know, patients will say like, of course I don't want to be like this. If it was that easy, I would just do it. So yeah. I think the recognition that it's it's a lot of hard work and a lot of persistence. And I think um, Einstein yeah. says it quite well, the, the definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over again expecting different results so what we're trying to show you we show you some ways to try something different and for most of us we have to try all these things so patrick tell us what, what, what happened sure. to you so can you see my screen now perfect yes yes okay i this is uh, so i'm 57 uh, when i started uh, after trying since 2014 and dr Kony tried me gave me different options i try most of the stuff and uh, still I couldn't figure out. So what I had is I started to realize that I had no plan. I thought I can do it by myself. Second, I started to change from diet to diet and, and I expected 10 pounds in no way. Then I eating clean. I thought I need to eat healthier and, and lose calories. And this doesn't work also not. Not too many liquids and using pops. Then during the weekend, normally everything what the rules was on the week, I broke it. Then uh, I was kind of tired during the day, then tried to control my hunger well, not with different things and avoid the trigger. So my trigger is fast food, so nothing worked. And then I thought it's easy, but it is not easy. I'm telling you, uh, my experience is in seven years, I tried the Wharton clip, it hasn't worked. I tried the FitPal application where you put all your food there and the cards hasn't worked. Then I tried the keto in my way, like uh, then I tried to eat healthier, thinking that if you avoid some things, you can do it. Then I tried to fast. Then I tried no carbs. Then I tried Ozempic, uh, I think uh, three months ago, and I had some side effect. I was very sleepy and couldn't work well. So, I'm not telling you they don't work. I only tell you uh, each person is different and it doesn't work for me. Then I was thinking to do the bariatric uh, uh, surgery also. This was part of my, uh, I wanted a solution, a quick solution. And then I realized that uh, first needs to, you need to be ready and change yourself. And it's it's a mindset. It's a mindset that you need to do. It's It's not, if you are not ready, it's tough to do it. Then I decide, okay, they introduced me of OptiFast. You only have a vanilla and chocolate in Canada. It's a sachet that you need to eat four per week, four per day, sorry. And I start in February 6th. And I thought, okay, I will try it. And nothing can, can be worse than not trying. And I picked vanilla because uh, I get a chocolate. I'm not a chocolate guy and eat too much chocolate with Tim Horton. So I wanted to do the vanilla. So I decide, and then what's this? You put your your sachet in a in a in a in a in a in a glass like this with my nutri bullet. Then you shake it for 15 minutes, and it comes a milkshake. You get one and a half glass of milkshake that you need to drink in two or three minutes. It's not a drink that you have it. You need to really drink them all. 
And uh, I thought, okay, it sounds great, vanilla. Then I realized, okay, what is the struggles? And I'm now six weeks on the program. Four shakes per day. You have two flavors. You can drink water, meal, or sugar-free uh, to keep some flavors for your digestion. If some people get diarrhea, some people has uh, constipation, so uh, you can drink metamucil, not sugar-free, and nothing else. So, uh, so basically, I am 37 days without any solid food in my mouth. And then, and food is everywhere. You watch TV, you go out, you see the burgers, you smell. So it is a tough one. So then what's happened? I lost in six weeks 30 pounds. What is 13.6 kilos? I am right now in 189 when I started was 229. Then I wanted to visualize what means 30 kilos. So this what they see in the photo is one kilo of beef. Now multiplied by 13.6, this is what I lost. Then uh, I have not for six weeks, no solid food and uh, I, I am still six weeks to go. My goal is to, I don't think it's a weight, is to try to lose as much as possible and i set my mind for what i need to eat so then you have a couple of options what is like kind of unfair in us you have optifast in you have soups you have other products then you have trani what is you can put flavor so you don't need to drink for six weeks only the vanilla milkshake you can have strawberry hazel and you can flavor it so uh, it, it can improve your uh, your uh, resistance. And then I found the website where, believe it or not, you can find all the Optifast product in Canada will give you options. And I'm not telling you to go there and I'm not telling the people go and buy them. Uh, this is a 900 calorie diet and you need to be monitored by a doctor. This is not doing it yourself and go and buy it. This is a monitor stuff and it's, and then uh, what uh, what I learned from this, uh, you need to understand why you eat. There is a reason why you eat. If you don't understand why you eat, I go down and go back like a binge, go back my kilos. Then it's a lifestyle change. So you, it's not losing weight. It's only understanding, uh, and I name it, and I will see in the end, let's, you need to build a relationship with food and you need to understand. So I, I tell you like an exact then you need to have a support group and you guys have a group so we created we are 17 people and we create in whatsapp what is a technology of today and you can create a group very simple and when somebody struggles, the other 15 jump in and try to help you so a support group is huge piece and then the other thing that i learned you need to buy you a good scale and not cheat if you buy a cheap scale you will try to put the weight in the right side of the weight or put or make you lighter so the number looks better. In this weight that you see there, you have four points where you need to put your feet so you cannot cheat. And the weight is the weight. And it costs $53. Then second, this system has a, 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 a software that you can get your BMI, you can get all your numbers in, in a computer so you don't need to write it down. And I tell you, my my final goal is not losing more 30 pounds, is changing my relationship with food. So I, believe it or not, I, I would love to have this presentation 25 years ago. I, I'm doing it, I'm, I'm getting this presentation like too late. I think this presentation needs to be presented to all, everybody before. Then it's a lifetime change. It's not, and, and then, uh, I want to live longer and I want that my family enjoy me longer. And the other piece what I learned is as soon as you, the knowledge is there, the help is there. You need to only ask for it. Like I'm telling you, I now, uh, I'm, I never until 50s, until two weeks ago, I never cooked nothing at home. I have, I could burn water technically. And now I'm starting to cook and learn how you mix them, how you do it better. I'm now to understanding and the knowledge is there. The problem is we sometimes think we can do it by ourselves, and there is no knowledge. But 
for me, Optifast has worked. I'm telling you, it looks easy. It's not. Six. Uh, the only thing what I learned from this on the 4th of May when I finished this program, I will not drink any milkshake ever again. This is the only one I, I'm pretty sure. And I learn now to eat better. I'm, I'm, I have a better understanding. And, and Vinny, uh, Ginny, you came 25 years too late for me. You needed to be earlier. This needs to be teach in school. This needs to be teach in the university. This needs to be teach to every every immigrant who comes to Canada from for to get your citizenship. You need to get this training because we don't know about this stuff. And the information is there, but we are sometimes lazy. And then tips. I park now three blocks from the supermarket and walk. So you do some exercise. I, uh, this is the first one you need to do. Then when I see a commercial, I walk away from it and do my five minutes that you always, because everything at night is food. Uh, then if you want to watch a movie with a uh, popcorn or going to a movie, you watch a movie during the day with the light on and then the popcorn disappeared because the atmosphere is not there. And, uh, and then uh, try to uh, not, uh, and then the other piece what I learned is the example of the parents will be passed to the next generation. So we need to be very careful with it. People are, uh, kids are a, a sponge of knowledge and they learn all the bad habits of us. So this is a commitment. So we, this is the only way I can spell. And I'm, I will start next week to play tennis with Mr. Uh, with Dr. Kurni and he played with me like three months ago when I was a chubby guy. I'm still kind of still chubby, but I will I will fight it better this time. And hopefully in in the summer I will be in better shape, but I'm working on it. So this is what I can share. I'm I'm it's a one experience, patient experience, and I try everything. Okay, this is what I can share with you guys. You have questions, that's it. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um so um what do you think uh, was a turning point for you? What, what, what you know, I, I remember you from the summer, you came out to tennis once or twice and you stopped coming. Um, and then the, the BRAVE trial that you entered, you were hoping to get the bariatric surgery yeah. with your randomized medical therapy, but you're a changed man. It's, it's, it's a mindset. Believe it or not, and people need to, I tell you from the patient side, if you are not ready to the change and you don't understand the slides, the first 10 slides that they, this can give you more years and can help you and your family can have you one. If my family can have me one more day, enjoy with them, it's good enough. And But your mind need to be changed. This is like, a, a, I was not ready. I tried bariatric, I tried everything, but you do it halfway and you think and you want not to share it with nobody because you're kind of, kind of embarrassed and, and you need to pass this mentally. And I think uh, we patient, we need to share it with more patient. So people feel like, feel it more. This is what needs to happen. Everybody who is successful need to be do it because when you hear another patient, you got for it. And, and in my case was, I told you, I want the bariatric surgery. I wanted a quick fix and eating more burgers. I learn now, this is not what I'm doing. I'm not, doing a quick fix to eat burgers again i want to change my lifestyle and this it's a mindset and this this is what we need to do and uh, i hope uh, other people from my program or other programs share it with the people who start because this is the best motivation and having a support group if, and, and you will fail and, and i don't talk about fail uh, every time that something doesn't work you need to learn from it only when when you've done everything bad write in a paper everything what you learn and then automatically the negative becomes positive so it's a it's a tricky one i tell you it took me seven years to figure it out and i'm not ending i'm only in the middle of the journey but you can see i'm i know now i will make it and i will continue doing it and i will change my lifestyle so why do so many people not take the the, the steps the first steps to get there is it um why why, why do they just why do they stay where they are? It's very difficult. Look, I tell you, it's very difficult to ask for help. And we normally ask for help. Look, if you have a pain, I give you an example from the patient side. If I feel a headache and it's a headache, I take a tarot, that's it. 
So in, 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 in overweight is the same. If you gain two or three weights, the rule must be if you gain three or four, six uh, pounds in, in a short lapse, you need to ask for help and try to treat it. But not you wait until it's 40 and then you have the struggle. So it is, uh, I think we as a patient need to share more of the experience to the, to the guy who has it. And it's very difficult. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. I give an example, like uh, when I was going into your, uh, 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 to your, where, where I had treatment, you was fit. So a guy who is fit is easy to talk to the, uh, to the guy who is obese, it's not so easy. But when you feel like, understand what the guy feels, it, it feels embarrassed. You want not to help and you think you can do it by yourself and it's i don't think uh, weight loss is a help by himself it's very it's a support group it's together uh, and then stress how you manage stress is the other big factor because people eat for stress but i'm telling you I, it took me seven years i cannot believe it it took me so long and I failed, I thought not failed, but I tried six or seven, I tried everything. I wanted to do it, but I was not kind of ready there. Thank you so much. So hopefully it helps somebody or it, it was only alerting to somebody. It's only one case. I'm not trying to teach you. I cannot talk about uh, any one case, but uh, this is how it is. So uh, hopefully it helps somebody. And uh, anytime that I, I will, I'm now talking to anybody who wants to help, I will give him my advice. I cannot teach him. I think you need to go to a doctor and always reach a doctor. The problem is we sometimes don't think weight loss is a problem until we have 40 pounds. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Uh, I'm stopping sharing. Now you can... Now it's, it's yours for part. I only I tried to give you my experience. Okay. Thanks so much, Patrick, for sharing your story. Uh, we'll actually be talking about stress shortly. So, uh, so then, and, and Gini, only send me the presentation when you have, because I, I wanted this presentation only it's 20 years late, but I would, uh, I will still learn from it. Absolutely. And, you know, the session's being recorded. So we'll also be uh, uploading that onto our YouTube channel. But I'll also be sending over the slides to everyone. I have everyone's email, so no worries yeah, about I will that. Stay to, I, I want to hear about the stress and that's it. <laughs> Definitely. All right, we'll move forward then. Sure. Um, yeah, I also just want to thank Patrick. I think you touched on a lot of really good points, especially, you know, about the mentality and the lifestyle and how it needs to sh uh, shift. And we'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide and how that really relates. So in the BRAVE trial, um, we'll talk a little bit about who's eligible. And if you're interested in, uh, in being part of it, just email our, uh, our clinic. So drkernew232 at gmail.com. Uh, but the people who could participate are you know, patients who have a BMI of 35 or over, um, who have suffered a heart attack or prior, you know, um, have ca cardiac compl complications, um, have not been hospital hospitalized for heart failure in the last 30 days, uh, have not had a heart attack or stroke in the last 90 days, not currently dependent on drugs or alcohol, uh, not pregnant, uh, and no, no major cancers uh, in the last two years, and no bariatric surgery or a major abdominal surgery. So we'll talk about that in a little bit and why. Uh, and willing to provide informed consent uh, and attend all the follow-up study visits. And we'll talk about why as well, these last two points. So now that we talked a little bit about the eligibility, uh, we'll talk about the study itself and how it works. So after you know, you're know you eligible, uh, you're put into two groups. So either one and you're randomized to either one. So there's one hand, the bariatric surgery, which we'll talk about and what that means, uh, and the weight management group, which is basically you know changing your lifestyle and losing weight through non-surgical means. And then there's a follow-up period. So on the next slide, um, Yep. yep, so on the next slide here, we'll talk about the weight management and what that means. So basically as part of the weight management group, uh, you'll be meeting in the first half, in the first six months, you'll be meeting weekly to bi-weekly uh, for 90, 60 to 90 minutes uh, per week. And then after six months, you'll sort of lessen the frequency to bi-weekly to monthly. 
um, say, uh, for you know another six months and then every month or so. Uh, and then as well, you're going to get counseling from you know nutrition, physical activities, and weight management. So as you can see in this group, there's a lot of work that goes into it and it's a lot of hard work. And I think Patrick brought up a really good point is that, you know, um, the science tells us that it's useful and it's necessary, but you also need a support group. And we're here to help you. You know, the clinic, we have our multiple uh, clubs. We have, you know, our YouTube videos, uh, which will help you reach your goal uh, in that aspect. So on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, bariatric surgery here. Uh, when it happens is, you know, 30 days after you're told you're part of the surgery group uh, and typical wait time, if you're not part of the, st uh, the study is one to two years. Um, and the, the surgery is going to be laparoscopic or bypass, uh, mostly actually as in the brief trial, it's laparoscopic. And we'll talk about what that means in a sec. Um, but what that surgery does basically is it reduces your the size of the stomach. And it's one, one of the best known ways uh, of attaining significant, you know, and long lasting weight loss through surgical means. So, but what's important to know with the bariatric surgery is it alone, it's not gonna, you know, um, it's not gonna solve all the problems, you know, um, around 10 to 15% of the patients end up regaining some of the weight in the long term, And so, you know, you have to consistently change your lifestyle and, you know, continually improve after even the surgery. Um, Dr. Kearney, anybody wants to jump in here? Any no, I think we did. Uh, I think we have an excellent webinar on the experience of bariatric surgery. So this trial is is going to look at what's best if you're overweight and risk for heart disease or have heart disease. So is it better to go to bariatric surgery or is it better to uh, do what Patrick does lifestyle changes? Uh, so, so that's a point to that. Um, so that's wonderful. And uh, uh, next slide, please. And this is sure. a comp we're not going to spend too much time about the, the, the surgery, that we'll leave that there, but it, yep. it's life-changing surgery. Um, it, you know, you, you don't go backwards from this. Next slide, please. And uh, we'll have a webinar and uh, we're not going to be, so, so you're, you're going to remove a good part of your stomach. Next slide, please. And your appetite will be suppressed. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it, you know, the average weight reduction is 20 to 30 percent of your body weight. And you also mentioned, Adam, that um, now there's this stress and mindfulness. And uh, one of the things is that we eat for all sorts of reasons. So um, I'm curious to hear about um, how do we cope better? Yeah, I'll pass it on to Ginny here. I think she, she that's her section, but yeah, for sure. Yeah, so we'll talk about stress and sort of mindfulness. And we do have a lot of videos on this already, as well as a group. Uh, but we'll go into that more. I'll start by talking about um, working, understanding the relationship first between stress and diabetes, and then sort of talking about the negative implications of this. So we've already talked about the importance of weight loss and diabetes remission. And um, here the graph actually, it shows that correlation between weight loss and the portion of diabetics entering remission. Um, and so we've already talked about this sort of early on. So, okay, let's say you're convinced and you decide you want to lose weight and put your diabetes into remission. So the only problem is that nothing you do seems to work. And there may be a factor that you haven't considered, which is stress. And we all have varying amounts of stress and we associate it with a lot of the challenges that we have to deal with. And as your diabetes gets worse, your stress gets worse. And then it's sort of this ongoing vicious cycle. So what is the role of stress and weight loss in weight loss prevention and here i'll explain why so your body experiences a, a three structure system and this system is called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or hpa for short and it's made up of three different structures which you may have guessed already by the name the hypothalamus the pituitary gland and the adrenal glands and you know i won't be going into detail but what's happening here essentially is that when you're stressed out a chain reaction happens with these three structures um, and it starts out with that little region in your brain called the hypothalamus and so when you're stressed your hypothalamus will release a hormone uh, that's called corticotropin releasing hormone or crh for short that's on the top left corner of that image there and then it's going to travel down to another area in your brain called the pituitary gland and it'll tell the pituitary gland to release a hormone of its own uh, so you can see this is a whole chain reaction that's happening and the hormone that's released is acth for short for adrenal corticotropic hormone and this hormone will travel through the blood until it gets to the kidneys and then it'll tell the adrenal glands that that lie right on top of your kidneys to release the final hormone that you may already be familiar with, which is called cortisol. 
So cortisol causes a bunch of changes to occur in your body. Uh, and it's usually good and helpful, but it also causes your blood sugar levels to rise. Uh, so your blood sugar levels to rise. Um, and uh, we also know about a different hormone called insulin, and it has a job of allowing the glucose in your blood to be taken up by the cell so that we can actually use that energy uh, to do different activities and complete you know, daily tasks that we need in our day-to-day -day lives. But when your blood sugar is always high, your cells become very you know, used to uh, insulin and they become less sensitive to insulin. So it means you need way more insulin to deliver those glucose to your cells, and that's essentially what type 2 diabetes is. So since insulin is a fat storing hormone, the higher it is, in, um, the higher it is, the more energy you store as fat, which ultimately means that you're gaining weight, which is why when you're stressed, oftentimes you're, you're gaining weight. So you can see that stress does cause you know, a bunch of reactions in your body. So now I want to talk about what we can do to actually stop this process. You first need to seek those right resources out to cope with the stress effectively and then actually target the source of your stress to manage it better. And we can uh, work on fixing uh, any damage that the stress has to cause that has caused on our body. And one helpful thing that we can do is actually exercise. And that's something that I've talked about earlier. And it, it not only reduces your blood glucose levels, but uh, it, it also targets not only the symptoms of stress, but the stress itself. And another great resource to use is our YouTube channel. And you can just Google Dr. Kearney's YouTube channel and you have free public access to you know, all of his great advice and um, advice gathered from researchers uh, from uh, in these videos. And if you click on his channel, it'll be the first link to come up and you can click on the videos tab and then scroll down to watch one that you like. And here I selected the Mindfulness Club, which is a great resource for coping with the stress. And you can skip to various points in the video, um, which are broken up by subtopic and receive the information that you're looking for. And you just need to hover your mouse over, uh, hover your mouse over that red bar there to, to go to a section that you'd want to see. Okay, so finally, we'll talk about SMART goals, which is something that um, I like to mention at all of our meetings. And SMART is an acronym that we use for effective goal setting. So SMART is one that's specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. And what I'm actually going to do is send a form in the chat here. I want everyone to fill out that form. And um, once you do fill out that form, it'll be you'll be entered into a draw to win our book, 30 Days to a Healthier You. Um, and so I encourage everyone to click on the link that I've sent in the chat right now and do that. Um, while you're doing that, I'll be explaining uh, more specific examples for SMART goals. So we want our goal to be specific because if our goal is too big, then it can be harder to stay focused. Um, and so for example, rather than saying, I just wanna look great this summer, you can be more specific by saying I want to eat I want to eat less to lose you know three kilograms of weight uh, and the goal should also be measurable so it's important uh, so that we know that when we achieve our goal uh, we're able to monitor our progress so if you have type 2 diabetes and you can set a target HbA1c level for example uh, from your next lab test and then we also want our goal to be attainable so we need to ensure that our goal is challenging but also realistic you know, you can say, um, I'm going to reduce my stress by taking time to relax each day. Um, but, and I can start with five to 10 minutes of relaxation exercises each day. So taking it step by step is, I think, really helpful. And just reminding yourself that, in fact, making progress to better your health, uh, even if small or really short, uh, can be still really helpful. And you also want your goal to be relevant. So you have to figure out what's important to you. So for example, if you're looking to get off medications because that's really important to you and yeah, then this can be your motivation and uh, you can set great goals to be able to do that. Okay, lastly, your goal must be time bound. So ask yourself when you want to reach your goal by. So remember to be realistic, but also flexible. So an example might be, um, I'm gonna lose three kilograms by March 30th, 2021. And so now you have a deadline for yourself, you know, you have that pressure and hopefully someone that's able to keep you accountable. So with these tips in mind, you know, you can, we can better our chances of achieving our goals and just work towards a healthier us. And yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, fill out this form uh, for a draw to win 30 days to a healthier you. And for anyone tuning in through the website, you can also be uh, able to find this form in, in the description below um, and you know, enter for a chance to win this great book that was written by Dr. Kernu as well as the volunteers. 
So that form is going to be available permanently there, so you can mm -hmm. enter anytime. Is that right, Jenny? So the form will yes. always be there on our, our YouTube channel as well. So uh, we'll have periodic draws. So if you don't want to fill it out today, I fill out multiple times. It, uh, let, let, let's make some progress. Let, 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 let's, let's work with Patrick and work with others and uh, Jenny and her team. And uh, thanks. All right. Thanks for everyone who was able to make it to this call. Uh, I think, thank you, Patrick, again, for presenting your slides. You know, all the volunteers who helped me out today with this presentation, I'm going to give a floor to Bo and Dr. Kearney for any last words before I stop the recording. Oh, I, I think it was great. Thanks to everyone. And uh, I think Patrick, you're very inspiring. So I think it'll be really good for people to, who weren't able to join tonight to, to listen to your talk and, and get inspired because it's very, I think you were very inspiring. It was great that you joined. And Patrick, I'm just going to give you that book, Three Days to Health to You. Maybe you should, maybe you should write the next book. Um, and uh, I just want to thank everybody, all the presenters, good science, good practicalities, try something different. Um, and uh, wow, if you would have said 10 years ago, diabetes can be put in remission, I would say that's impossible. You know what? What's impossible yesterday is possible today. So uh, fantastic. So uh, Jenny, I'll give you and your team the last word. And thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. The uh, sugar hour went over for a little uh, longer than an hour, um, but uh, that's my fault. Um, there's too much to say and so much good information. Thank you all. Jenny, what else do you want? You can wrap it up. Mm -hmm. I, I think maybe we should call these sugar hours from here on forward. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out. Uh, feel free to watch this video online. It'll be uploaded within the next couple of days. Again, thank you to our team. Thanks for Bo and Dr. Kearney for uh, joining us and helping to answer any questions. And thank you, Patrick, for your short presentation as well. I will write the book, I promise. And uh, Jenny, tell us about the one in the, the April 14th meeting. What's that gonna be about? Mm -hmm. So the April 14th meeting, uh, which uh, is gonna be same time Wednesday, 6 to 7 p.m. or possibly past 7 p.m. It'll be about working together as a team. We'll also be touching on the actual medications. Uh, Ozempic, which we already talked about today, we'll be talking about even in even more detail the next time. And, you know, there's a lot of people, I think, involved in one person's care. And I think that's, you know, a privilege, but also really difficult to navigate. So, you know, going through potential uh, suggestions for solutions, ways to better navigate that, and just focusing on working on all this together. And I like to see friends, family, because if you have diabetes, your your brother, sister, your your parents, kids are at risk for diabetes. Um, so let's actually put a big dent because when I started practice, uh, diabetes was not a big problem; it's tripled. Now we have to do something to reverse that process, and you showed us how. So thank you so much, Jenny, and the rest of the team. Wonderful presentation. Thank you again.